travelers flying along the eastern shores of South America cross a great river cutting through a seemingly endless tropical forest, the Amazon, largest river in the world. It drains a valley almost as large as Europe, a valley that holds the world's largest jungle, a valley hot and humid that has stubbornly resisted conquest by man. Even today, few travelers venture into the swamplands of the Amazon. From its source to its mouth, the Amazon flows close to the equator. The climate is hot the year round. The valley draws steady, damp winds off the ocean. These winds bring an unusually heavy rainfall, especially from January to July. The Amazon is fed by seven great tributaries, each more than a thousand miles long. Together they drain the central valley, 2,000 miles long and 800 miles across at its widest point. The Amazon covers much of the Republic of Brazil and parts of several other nations. The source of the Amazon River itself is thought to be 12,000 feet up in the Andes Mountains of Peru, less than 100 miles from the Pacific Ocean. The river bursts through the last mountain pass to fall into the broad, flat central plain. Now wide and deep enough for large vessels, the river rolls 3,000 miles to the Atlantic Ocean. In places, there are broad lakes where the river thrusts the land away almost to the horizon. There are vast, desolate swamps in the lowlands washed over by high water. Occasionally, the river is walled in by steep floods. At such places as this, on the upper reaches of the Amazon and its tributaries, stand occasional settlements of primitive Indians. These tribes live by hunting, fishing, and a Stone Age kind of agriculture. The Indians live in family groups. Several families form a village under one leader or chieftain. The chief's oldest daughter, Loyla, works in the manioc patch. The roots of the manioc plant are the staple food of these Indians. Preparing manioc is hard work. All the Indians need comes from the jungle and from the river, reeds and wood fibers for matting. Thread from palm or bamboo fibers spun in the same way as woolen or cotton thread. The men spend much of their time preparing hunting equipment, spears, bows and arrows. The older hunters teach the boys how to use the weapons. Hunting is difficult in the Amazon jungle. Although there is a rich wildlife, no large land animals live there. Curious birds and animals live protected in the dense foliage. Here, the flat-nosed porcupine finds its home. And the maracaja, or spotted jaguar. The silk-haired night monkey hides in the trees. And the odd-looking sloth, an animal that rarely comes down from his high perch. The anteater is another unusual animal. His meat is a delicacy for India. And there are dangerous reptiles in the jungle. Today's hunt was very successful. The hunters bring home an anteater, a sloth, and two monkeys.
Whenever there's plenty of food, it's time for a feast. And after the feast, the whole tribe gathers for a dance. Most young people of the tribe join in. The women and small children watch. As it flows towards the ocean, the Amazon widens until it becomes a slow-moving sea. Placid as the river seems in its quiet mood, it turns into an endless sea when it floods across the farmlands and over roads and villages. Powerful tides swell it twice a day. Where the banks are high and protected from floods, villages spring up like the village of Santo Antonio de Ica. Rubber farmer Sebastian Batista lives near Santo Antonio. He comes to the village regularly to deliver the rubber he has collected and to exchange it for merchandise. Since there are very few roads through the Amazon Valley, most villages can be reached only by water. Farmer Sebastian Batista, like most people of the valley, is of mixed white and Indian blood. His son, Georgia, tends the garden, leaving his work to see what his father brought home from the village trading post. Grandmother Batista mixes manioc with palm oil to make a dish called parrafe. A simple press called a titi removes the poisonous liquid from the manioc pulp. Meanwhile, Georgia climbs up the bacaba palm to gather the soft bacaba nuts for the evening meal. Several nut-bearing palm trees grow in the jungle. The bacaba nuts are crushed into an oily paste. Sister Blanca is mixing the nuts with hot water to soften the nut meat. Cousin Pedro Batista lives nearby. Every day he makes the rounds of his rubber tree. His wife, Pepita, and the little children stay at home. Women and children rarely go into the jungle. The rubber trees which the two farmers tend are native to the Brazilian jungle. Several kinds of rubber-bearing tree grow wild in the Amazon Valley. From here they were taken to Asia where they are now cultivated on special rubber plantations. An incision in the bark starts the sap flowing. A can of this size will be filled in four hours. Most of the trees belong to the trading post and the farmers share in the revenue. Farmers like the Batistas tend about 100 trees per family. In many Amazon farm families, men eat first, while women serve. After the meal, Pedro lights a fire under the kettle. The milky rubber sap called latex is poured slowly over a paddle to form a soft layer which the smoke of the fire will harden into rubber. The air will age and darken the balls of latex. The two families jointly brand their latex for identification. B stands for their family name. Batista. Next day, it is Pedro's turn to take one ball of rubber to the trading post to exchange it for some goods for his family. To the Batista family, the trading post is the most important place in the valley. It is his only link with the outside world. The trader takes over all the crude rubber from the farmer and credits his earnings to his account. Whatever Pedro buys, the trader will charge to his account. At the river's edge, rubber balls are loaded onto boats. 
Rubber is an important export of this area. The shallow waters along the river's edge abound with river turtles, like the Chakaja. Fishermen often hunt for turtles' eggs on the sandy shore. A deep hole in the sand betrays a turtle's nest. Turtles' eggs are considered a great delicacy. They lay a dozen or more in holes which they dig in the soft sand. These are about the size of chickens' eggs. Fully grown turtles, prized for their steak, are loaded on the river boats and sent to markets of the large river towns. Fishing is important too. Fishermen at Ikar use nets to catch the large meaty peraruku. Some of the peraruku is eaten fresh, but most of the catch is preserved by drying. Dry peraruku is sold all along the river bank and represents a significant part of the food supply of the Amazon people. So work goes on for six days a week. On Sundays, many farm families, like the Batista family, travel to the river port town of Porto Alfonso. Everybody is dressed in his Sunday best for church. After church, there is dancing, the one recreation that all valley people seem to enjoy. So they live, these people who dwell along the Amazon. Producing little, they depend on the outside world for many of their needs. The way to the outside world is the river. River boats of many shapes fly the wide Amazon. As the river passes the midpoint, the size of settlements increases. In the center of the valley, where the Rio Negro joins the Amazon, lies the city of Manaus. More than 100,000 people live here in a modern river harbor deep in the jungle. Through Manaus, passes much of the jungle's produce, and the produce of the outside world comes to the jungle via Manaus. Melon. Bundles of jute for mattresses and burlap. Crude rubber. And some jungle-grown bananas. Manaus is sometimes called a city of markets. The harbour marketplace supplies not only the needs of the large city, it also serves as a loading point of jungle and farm products. Farm products and imported goods are handled by trading companies at Manaus. These companies control the network of trading posts throughout the whole valley. The streets and business houses still mirror the era half a century ago when Manaus was the rubber capital of the world. The Amazon Theatre is a monument of the old days when the rubber boom was bringing great wealth to the city and the valley. All along the waterfront live the fishermen and the small boat owners close to the river which gives them their livelihood. From Manaus, Ocean-going ships carry the trade of the jungle to the ocean port. As it nears the ocean, the Amazon widens and spreads out into a large delta. On some of the islands, the jungle has been cleared for pasture, as on the large river island of Marajo. Here, several great cattle ranches produce beef for the valley's own markets. From island corrals, the cattle are loaded into cattle boats for packing houses in the larger river towns. As the river comes closer to the ocean, the number of industrial settlements increases. Mining towns, oil refineries, and rubber research centers. Ninety miles from the sea lies the great port of Belém. 
center of life on the lower Amazon. Through Belem passes most of the trade between the valley and the rest of the world. Bales of jute go out to the world market. Crates of manufactured goods come to the Amazon Valley. Here, Brazil nuts are loaded for export. Here, ice is taken on board for packers and fishermen living upriver. Belém is a beautiful and thriving city. The name Belém means Bethlehem in Portuguese. 230,000 people make their living here from trading with the valley and the coast. The valley's largest city, Belém, still stands as the gateway to the Amazon, an outpost of civilization set on the world's largest river. The river rolling through a vast valley of tropical forests that still stand out mass. 